Hey, Yuri, how's it going? All right, how are you? You, uh, you in your car or a server room? <laughs> uh, can you hear the AC with me, Tim? Is this better? Well, yeah, what's that, the air conditioner? Yeah. Oh, you don't want to turn that off, you'll die, man. <laughs> yeah, I normally, like, I don't turn, uh, turn air conditioning on, but, like, I think that's the only few, one of few days of the year that I... Uh, how hot is it there? Uh, it's... Oh, let me check. Oh, it's not bad. It's eight, it says 88. Yeah, August. That's kind of like the nastiest month on the East Coast. So we're going to be... We're going to almost get... We're going to get to 98. This is in the mountains here, so super heat wave through Sunday and um, we have smoke so it's like hazardous conditions outside and the sun is orange and it looks like a light fog out there and that's not from any fire near us that's just from all the fires in California and Oregon like last year yeah. we, we, we got we also had like a strange sun from basically California fires right our fires the fires in southern Oregon and California affected you guys. It's fucked up, man. Um, I wanted to ask you a quick question about your uh, ontology and your CSV file. Mm -hmm. um, do you have relationships between ontologies stored in there? Um, so we have... Uh, so don't, the relationship that we have that's stored right now is the only one and it's contained, contains so basically parent children um you, just ha you have like a little almost just almost a taxonomy yeah it's uh, yeah it's a direct yeah so it's it's not <clears throat> it's uh it's a graph it's a direct acyclic graph um and i think they're like so so i think i mentioned last time they they're actually converting it into proper owl uh, proper of, uh, RDF yeah. format. Um, so I think they're adding they're adding other relations now. So so it will actually be like more more rich uh, ontology. So there's but, other uh, folks that are that are there's other folks that are more directly responsible for maintaining the ontology in general. Um. So. Um, Maintaining is a complex word. Um, so or building, or, or who, who's most responsible for um, the overall structure of it? If there's someone out there that's going to add relationships and, and, and moving stuff to RDF, has got to be strategic. Yeah, so there are people who like are ontologists. Um, that, but but ultimately, we store we store the like we store the data using this. Let's call it taxonomy. If it's a proper, I, I forgot what the difference. I think the difference is one is complete, one's not complete. Is that is that the right? Uh, I, what do you mean complete? You talking mathematically okay. or something? Yeah, I, 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 at some point I think I uh, I looked into it, but I forgot. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I just know that um, you know a taxonomy usually is not entity centric. Usually it's topic centric. So when people use the word taxonomy what they typically mean, so I used it wrong, because what they typically mean are topics, not, not entities, right? And when you talk a graph or a knowledge graph, almost always the center of the knowledge graph are entities and the relationships between those entities. So you have, if I had to call it something, I know it's a DAG, that, but that's a data structure point of view, right? Um, but really what it is, is a nascent knowledge graph, right? Which is trying to move yeah. towards a more rich knowledge graph and trying to move towards ontology and really, the only difference between a knowledge graph and ontology to me, the way I would define it, is they use completely different tools, and you're doing different types of reasoning, and a knowledge graph doesn't have a schema, right? An ontology, that it has a schema. It's got the TNA, right? You know, so the instances and the classes. Uh, but either way, a knowledge graph and ontology both cover entities for us as their primary focus, right? And relationships between entities. 
It's just you're going to use something like Neo4j for a knowledge graph, and typically it's used for enterprise integration of data. And you can't do any inferencing on it. You'll have to spit out the data from Neo4j into Protege to do some sort of uh, reason. So, make some sense? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, taxonomies are hierarchical topics, basically. That's when in the the way it's used ninety eight percent of the time. Okay. And in the taxonomy world, if you're you know ignorant of ontology and knowledge graphs and all that stuff, you'll have an entity file, you call it in the old days, an authority file of entities. So you kind of have an authority file of entities with a sort of uh, loose relationship between them, which makes it almost like an old school thesaurus, a search thesaurus. Mm -hmm. You know, this, shit, this shit's all just continuum and community of practice that rose out of and software tools that are used. So, anyway, that's my lecture on semantics. I'm done. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah. So ultimately, uh, if um, uh, so, we, we as a team were responsible for for like you know fixing fixing the the graph, fixing you know names, fixing definitions, um, because uh, and, and I'm specifically responsible for mapping. Not just me, but actually the whole team is responsible for mapping. But I'm trying to automate it. Uh, but um, but like, but then, uh, um, then there are people who are looking more into like, you know, how do we use this in search? How do we, how do we? Actually, I started doing a little bit of tagging, but but then people basically uh, looking into how can how can we use this as is in improving of our you know our know like our content basically. Right, right. And they're uh, doing it through through like you know ontological tools. It's interesting because in an organization that's an information or a content organization, right? Structure or unstructured. So at some point, there'll become a need for semantics, right? And it can rise up out of different primary uh, drivers. And for you guys, maybe that was the data integration was maybe your primary driver, from what I understand. And now it's moving into other uses of it, just because you have it and you could see other opportunities, right? And so it's going to yeah. evolve. Does that make sense, Yuri? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, and I need to, I need to, I, yeah, like I need to get involved more in the formal ontology stuff. But you know, uh, there are already a lot of people there, and they, you know, I have like no ontological opinions. So like I don't want to be. I like, once they figure it out, I think I'll I'll work with whatever they come up with. So. And, and when you have that CSV file, is that an export currently find, from, from some tool they use, or is it? Oh uh, no, well no no. So right now that's the ground truth, but at, at some point they will switch. Okay, so that, that so is will, coming from those folks. Yep, I get it. Yeah, well, but for now, for now that's ground truth. Like basically, it's that's the original. Uh, um, yep. You know, yeah. Yeah, no I know what okay. ground truth is. That's yeah. the authority records right there, man. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, any other updates on your on anything going on with ontology with you or your ontology related work? Um, no, I, I didn't have a chance to do a lot uh, with it this week. So. Uh, before I continue in this manner, <laughs> talking with you, does anyone have? Uh, any uh, like key things they want to sh talk about, so we don't I don't like use all the, all the time up before someone has something on their mind that's serious, uh, important to them. Just could blurt it out now. Otherwise, we'll we'll go around in a circle and get to everybody. But hopefully, we'll, I don't want to get to the end and not have enough time for something that's important. So, does anyone have something like that on their mind right now? Uh, I got two things. Um, one is like for. You know, if you're using uh, knowledge graph embedding type of things, uh, I actually found a nice uh, package called PyKeen, which has uh, built-in, you know, um, basically built-in training loops, PyTorch training loops that you can call uh, you with the optimizer and the model. 
and uh, it creates uh, transy, rotate, complex, all these different uh, knowledge graphy type of embeddings uh, for you. And you can also extend it with your own algorithms. They have a way to do that. So I found this out based on doing the homework in the CS224 uh, study group. So anyway, so that was one. Uh, another one. Oh, uh, oh, oh, just sorry. Can you? Uh, yeah. I, I couldn't get the exact name. What is it oh, again? So, oh, Pikey. Let me let me just paste it in here. Uh, cool. And, yeah, you know, I played with a bunch of embedding of those, but not that one. Yeah. I don't think I did like right. Sage Graph, and there were a couple yeah. other ones. Okay, Pi Keen. Oh, that's yes. a new one. Cool. Yeah. yeah, I hadn't seen this before, so I figured that most of you also hadn't. So the second thing that you know that was what my meeting was going long for. So one of our guys, you know, we have a celebrity uh, kind of person, a machine learning guy, uh, Yuri Kashnitsky. Uh, so he's he actually used to run like a very popular ML course. It was all his, he created it and he ran it and it was pretty popular. So anyway, so he works for us now. So he did uh, a recent project and he was talking about it. Um, he was using uh, something called Accelerate from Hugging Face. And uh, essentially it's a way to do multi-GPU training or you know, multi-TPU or whatever, but you can do multi-GPU, multi-node. Uh, he just did you know, one node multi-GPU. And he observed like it's a four GPU box and he observed like a four X increase in performance. So, you know, he was talking about how he did it and so forth. So it was actually quite interesting too. So here is, I can, I can share that one as well. The quick tour, the hugging face uh, documentation for that. And here they are. So yeah, that was the sum of what I had in uh, to share. Yeah, it's kind of interesting how Hugging Face is evolving, right? At the beginning, they were like a chat bot, mm -hmm. right. sort of, and then and, and with a, and that's where I got their logo from. And then they're just like taking all of the, they're like papers with code in a library, right? You know, like they take all the newest papers and on embeddings and transformers, mainly transformers, and then make them accessible to everybody. Right now, they're building on top of that, and they have a business too now, right? Where mm -hmm. they're doing yeah. auto, they're doing auto ML. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, you, you know you have to pay for that, but geez, that's going to be a great platform, I think, to do NLP on quickly and easy using managed yeah. services. Now, that makes sense if they they have this accelerate right to help speed up the right, exactly. GPU training. Yeah. yeah, so they obviously have a real. Yeah, I, I think they're um, also going in for you know the whole Jack's Blacks initiative that uh, we were yep. uh, we did. That's also right. another step in that direction, right? I mean trying to popularize uh, platforms on, by which you can do you know tpu based training or multi gpu training yeah. right because it's parallelism is built into the language right so here accelerate is kind of a thing on top you have to wrap your models in optimizer and it does the thing right for you and then you know you unwrap it and get your results and so forth so it's actually quite cool it's interesting because jeremy talking about um, from, from the um, auto ml point of view i heard jeremy talking uh -huh. um, uh, you know about he just just vitriol about gcp and he's like he's like this auto he, he's not vitriol he just gets emotional the auto mlp for the auto ml for gcp which is the vertex stuff which i used right mm -hmm. is focused on neural search right that's what they do at okay. the beginning of it for, and he just says that's just a ridiculous wasteful way of doing it now in my mind of course it, it, it's naturally it's natural coming out of gcp for them to take that approach because that's sort of their level with which they function at but he said that he loved the uh he actually loved and supported the uh hugging face approach so i haven't used it but i'm sure it's not focused on neural search right you don't you probably don't need that because you already have yeah. all the models. this, this so is like straight up uh, ddp data parallel uh, programming dpp i guess yeah okay. yeah, yeah yeah the the the, yeah. the accelerate is i'm yes. just talking sort of more broadly so. oh i see okay yeah no uh, hugging face is more algorithmic i think rather than, um, you know, the hyperparameter search kind of view. Okay. Um, look, I, I, uh, the video, four types of indexes. I watched that. That's mm -hmm. the one you posted. Yes. Um, that was a very good basic intro. I mean, I really, yes. I didn't quite understand that for vector search, you have that, um, 
the, 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 the flat index, I thought they were talking about a traditional index, but they're not, right? The flat index is just not, no processing on top of the vectors done to group them or to make them make a more efficient search, right? right? right. So the flat index is just like a vector space, right? Uh, exhaustive. You search exhaustive, you're guaranteed of the best results. Uh, yeah. with, you know, any approximations will take away the, you know, uh, the accuracy yeah. part, right? So, yeah. So you have a baseline. You use right. that as your baseline, and you try the other methods. And it's really interesting because all those other methods are all simply really ways of you know reducing the number of comparisons you have to do. And it's all about yes. really grouping or segmenting the vectors. You exactly. know, in a way, it's right. not that complicated or some crazy algorithm. It's just using existing right. stuff. I, I missed completely what video is that? Oh, that, um, that's, I'll, I'll paste it. Go ahead, Suji. Yeah. So this is the. Uh, blog post by Pinecone oh. that I shared. Oh, Pinecone. Okay, got it. Got it. Yeah. And uh, this one is like, you know, I, I thought of it as the FICE missing manual, right? I mean, because FICE doesn't actually have much documentation online. You basically have to look at code and figure out things. So here, this guy covered, you know, all the different kinds of uh, indexing, um, you know, vector indexing that uh, FICE supports. And, you know, the trade-offs of each and how they are implemented or or a high-level view of how they are implemented, right? So HNSW, yeah. I actually did not understand as well as I do now, following, um, you know, reading that thing. So, well, which one was HNLW? That the was... hierarchical small worlds network. Oh, right? so, you mean what's yeah. like graph? So there's a mm -hmm. graph. Yeah. Was that the one with the graph? And it has. Yes. Yeah, I only understood it in the most abstract way, but it, yeah. it's reducing um, jumps between exactly the graph. Right. Yeah, while indexing, you create those jumps. And so it's actually easier when looking it up, you basically follow those links that you created, right? So you're able to now um, go beyond uh, just, you know, neighbors and go and look at further ones. So shortcuts between nodes, right? So. Yeah, each vector represented a document is a vertex or a node in the right. graph, right? right. And so you, they pre-process that graph to try to reduce yeah, the, so the they jumps no longer, between yeah. similar ones, right? Right. So, so no, they actually uh, they connect the similar ones. And so that's a, you know, a regular um, small world graph. But part of being small world is also shortcuts to other. Um, so you know, the whole point, it's a small world, right? So you know, just the, the fact that you, know, you and I are um, you know, like 300 or 600 miles apart uh, geographically um, uh, would have, you know, the assumption would have been that we won't know each other, right? However, because of certain circumstances, now we do, right? So this is like a shortcut, right? Well, so, right. So, but, but is it like the IVF except, except and not technically, but conceptually, but instead of having in your IVF inverted file index with your Dietrich tessellation or whatever you know what mm -hmm. i mean right. instead of that you kind of like each one of those hexagons or whatever they are you know weird shape adjacent shapes right they're polygons, cutting up yeah. space yes. mm -hmm. the polygons thank you each one of the polygons almost in a very rough way is like one of those local graphs and then the local graphs are connected to each other so it's almost it's just another yes. way of grouping kind of like the ivf kind of the same yeah so there is a lot of overlap but for a long time, I, you know, whenever I heard HNSW, I would think of the Voronoi diagrams, right? So the, the, you know, the flat, I think what is called, the, the, whatever you mentioned, right? The, where you have these like intersecting graphs. And basically you say, okay, I just look up the centroids first and then find my uh, cluster and then look at my neighbors, right? Neighboring clusters only. So this, you know, but this is a little different. So I didn't actually know, yeah, realize that ahead of this before this blog post. It's kind of interesting to me, this is a very broad thing to say, but the um, in the embedding, you know, graph embedding stuff, not this stuff, but graph embeddings, you're, the thing you're assuming into your graph, which makes it all work, right, is it's your prior, right? Your prior is that things that are near each other in the graph are similar. Mm -hmm. And in a way, all these different types of vector indexes are sort of like creating that similar, like it's kind of, I think the HNSW might be actually better defining, like maybe you could think of it as a way of manipulating the graph so that 
that is more, even more true. I don't know. Maybe it's just making it more efficient to get between groups. But you know what I mean? It seems to me intuitively like the HNSW is doing something. Like if you could apply something to your graph to make that prior even more true, then your embeddings for your graph would be even better probably. Yeah. Uh, and so, that yeah. seems kind of like what HNSW is doing. Right. So if I were a researcher at a university, I'd take this idea, right, and, you know, try to prove it one way or the other. It's like an intuition, right? Correct. Of, Correct. Yeah. Of those two. Okay. Anyway. Yeah, that was really interesting. That, that, that whole that it was very quick and clear. Thank you for that. Sure. And that, w w while we're on this subject, we also had another thing which Yuri, you posted, right? And that one, I just watched the first half of that one. I didn't watch the second half because that was about benchmarking. But it was the open NLP meeting neural search with Haystack, although it's not really neural search, right? CG, it's vector uh, I search. missed that, actually. I uh, uh, I just went back and, uh, you know, so apparently it wasn't at 7 p.m. It just happened to be some other time, maybe it's a different time yeah. zone. Yeah, it was at uh, 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. okay. No, no, I missed it too, but the video is available now. Cause yeah, you're yeah, yeah, I po yeah, I posted the video. Yeah, I just saw that. So I, you know, pulled it up on my browser a few minutes before the meeting. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I actually was interested in the second part uh, more uh, because, but I, yeah, I couldn't watch it live. Uh, but, um, uh, but because that's, uh, that's from this Esper group uh, and they, Basically, they they figured they want to create their own benchmark for because they they, they thought other uh, data sets were not that great. So so I've seen the paper before, but I didn't look at details. So like I wanted to uh, see that. Um, I would say CG, if you're interested in it, that the first one is about so the second part is about benchmarking, which is great. This first one is it really it shows shows you what haystack is. It no. does, like from their point of view, because it's a haystack person. And it's interesting because they lead with scalable QA search. Ah, cool. And he talks okay. about extractive, and then he talks about generative. And he shows how you create a pipeline in haystack for the retrieve. You do a retriever, which is, you know, BM25 or whatever that is, you know, the, mm -hmm. the standard. And then, and then you do the reader, he calls it, which, so they have a, you know, a... You can add to your pipeline a reader, a module for a reader, and the reader reads the results and extracts the answers mm -hmm. and the context for the answers. So it's kind of, it was interesting the way they uh, presented it. Yeah. The, the retriever reader is actually standard terminology. Uh, yep. So you know, the reader is basically the, the question answer, and the retriever is the passage retriever. So. Yeah, yeah. And they, the, the generative one, I think, is not standard approach no, no, kind of I, I, have, yeah, I haven't I don't know much about it but but I didn't it made me think as vector search is actually a way of bringing a lot of transformers and NLP to the masses in a very different way True. Than, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, that, that's kind of how he presented it too okay um, anything else on vector search from anyone Oh, um, there was another one. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I forgot this one. Uh, anybody heard of uh, binary passage uh, retrieval? I think you might have mentioned it last time, but I don't think you explained it. Okay. So essentially, it's uh, an improvement over the dense passage retrieval where you have... Um, so this is, again, question answering. So essentially, you are training a twin tower kind of model where one tower um, is you know takes in uh, the passage text and creates an encoding. So you might have a BERT encoder or something, and it creates a dense vector out of it, right? And similarly, on the other side, you have the, the question. It takes in a question text and creates a question encoding. And then you are trying to project both of them into a common embedding space so that you know questions and answers that are relevant to each other, they come closer together. So what these guys have done is added between the dense encoding produced by the passage and the question, 
um, they they put in um, on each tower separate uh, learning to rank le learning to hash layers right and the purpose of the learning to hash layer is basically to turn these dense vectors into a vector of minus ones and ones so it's essentially a sign function right and the sign function is learned so essentially what they're doing is the sign function is like a scale tanh so you know it's just like beta times tanh of the input right and so yeah, as beta tends to infinity, it becomes like a straight sine function, like a, you know, the, what's it called, heavy side, right? Uh, straight, like uh, square, square kind of wave, um, or at least the front part of the square wave, right? Um, and, uh, you know, so essentially what they're doing is they're taking a tanh function and as the epochs progress, they scale it up higher and higher. And, it, but it's still differentiable because it's tanh, right? Whereas the square function is not actually differentiable. So, and using this, they learn this uh, hash for each side, and then um, they actually do the, so the, the retrieval process, the retriever, right? It has two functions, right? First off, it has to grab a whole bunch of um, uh, passages, right? And give you a subset of, you know, likely passages, right? Candidates. And then the second bit is to rank these passages so that the best one comes first, right? So for the first part, they're using Hamming distance uh, between the two, um, um, the the binary between the hashes between yes the between hashes. the yes between the hashes and for the second part they are using the binary vector from the passage with the dense vector from the uh, the question so that they can you know rearrange it and sort it in the right order so um, the the basic idea is that they are saying that they have it's not like a huge uh, state of the art improvement or anything um, they they have results comparable with uh, uh, DPR, the dense passive retrieval uh, pipeline, um, comparable in the sense like they're 2% maybe off, you know, sometimes they're better, sometimes they're a little worse. And, but uh, their um, resource utilization like disk, right? Because you have to store the entire uh, dense indexes for the passages on disk, you know, so that you don't have to recalculate them. Um, that has gone down from like a tenfold margin, right? So they had a 20 GB index and now it's like 2 GB. It's a, so you only, you only need a dense vector representation for the question? Yes. Well, and that is calculated, right? So the question comes in, it is calculated, or yes. it goes through BERT and all. So you don't have to actually store that. So if I looked at the point just before the hash is generated mm -hmm. for the answers, you know, not in the question answer process, but in the pre-process or whatever, if I look at that, um, that would be what? A binary vector of a certain number of dimensions. Yes. So it looked like a bag. It looked like a bag of words, basically. The old school, just count. Yes. No, it's not counts. It's a it's a zero it's, or a one. It's almost like a sparse vector, but here it's actually a, yeah zero or one. I think they transform it. Um, the input to that binary vector is minus one and one. I think they change it to zero and one at that point. Um, so they go zero and one, and that's probably a lot of dimensions. Where yes. I would guess. Is it like a yeah. hundred or like a thousand, or do we know if it's some weird like 10,000 or something? Yeah, I didn't actually uh, go that deep into the paper, but I thought it was a very cool idea. And I think they're going back. You're right. I mean, they're going back to the sparse representation, but now it's semantic aware sparse representation, right? Because you're, you know, getting it from your dense vector, which is all these, you know, all these signals from its neighbors. And now, you know, that you're kind of sending back into as a binary vector. So I, I uh, posted the paper, the uh, thing on archive, and within that you, there is references to the dense. Yeah. How do you how do you go from the question dense? How do you compare a dense vector with a, uh, a binary? A binary. Um, bin I mean, I understand you use a hash to get the candidates, mm -hmm. but then the candidates you find you get the uh, pre-calculated binary vectors. But how do you compare those two? They so, they are doing inner product. So basically dot product, one is like, you know, a vector of ints, another is a vector of float, but essentially they're you know, element-wise multiplication, right? So, so you can, so you just treat the binaries as floats and they're just both vectors and you do normal comparison? There's no pre-processing or something that's done to the binary or something that's done to the, the dense vector? No, there it's is no, yeah. So, but it's, um, it's basically inner product because, um, you know, essentially you're ranking them, so you don't actually need a denominator. Um, so, 
I guess you could have used cosine as well, but cosine, you know, cosine is the same here, right? I mean, you're basically doing element-wise multiplication. Yep. Oh. Yeah, it's interesting. It makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because there, if it works, I mean, if it even, you know, benchmarks close to what state of the art yeah. is, like yeah. a huge win, right? Because. Yep. Yeah, if you if you open that uh, PDF, you, it's right on the, you know the diagram is right on the top corner, so you can you know you, it's like uh, identical almost to the the DPR uh, twin tower thing, you know it's just an additional layer and then they're pulling out uh, the encodings from different areas. Yeah, nice description. I would assume it might that technique might be have broader implications for other types of models. That yes. hamming with a hash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I actually uh, I want to try it out, um, but you know so far I haven't gotten DPO to work well. So <laughs> yeah, once that works, then and of course I have to get back to that. Then I was actually pulled out from there and into this cell thing. But the health thing is actually progressing nicely. Um, you know, um, a I've gotten used to the strangeness of the code, and B I've uh, put in a proposal uh, to change the code to make it nicer, and that got accepted. So you know, hopefully. Did you use the uh, C four? Yes, method? I did. Yes. Oh. and so that was to help outline how you would like to re-architect it. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Um, anything else? That's it. Yeah. Well, um, and Yuri, did you have anything else you want to talk about or bring up? Questions? Uh, no. I actually have a question. Uh, on uh, so on uh, Yuri from uh, the class, did he actually move? Or, I think you worked in Germany before. Did you move to the uh, US? Or? I, I think he's in Netherlands now. I, oh, he Netherlands. Might he, he, might have, he might have been in Netherlands. Okay. I am. Um, I. I. I took a class. Um, I think last time when it was offered live, mm -hmm. um, and I, I, the homeworks were pretty intense. Um, and uh, yeah, I I stopped doing that. Uh, okay. It was. But it was a good. Yeah, it was a. Um, I think out of like um, general machine learning. Courses, yes. it, was, yes. it was pretty good. Yeah. How is the knowledge graph class progressing? I know you just gave us a little update of a tool, but um, that's actually a you know gra ML with graphs kind of uh, course, rather than yeah, yeah, yeah. you know knowledge graph knowledge is just graph. a portion of it. So yeah, yeah, of it's it's progressing at like really high speed and. Um, so far, I've been uh, kind of trying to keep up, and uh, well, uh, I mean, as of uh, this week, I will stop succeeding uh, <laughs> because. Uh, but I, I will probably catch up, you know. Well, as of last week, I have stopped succeeding um, because I was late in my homeworks and so on. Um, but so far, I've kept on, you know, with the lectures. Uh, so basically, we do the lectures ourselves, uh, two two lectures per week. And uh, on every third week, it's one lecture, and we have to finish off the homework and the collab for that, you know, the two and a half or the, or the three weeks, right? So it's a pretty hard, um, you know, that pace. And uh, a lot of people have dropped out already. So I think it's a bit counterproductive at this point. Uh, but we do end up uh, discussing stuff and finding stuff and sharing stuff. So that was nice. Um, but we don't do classes in the regular sense, like you know, like the DL PyTorch uh, kind of yeah. thing that we used to do. Um, there was a start at that, like, but you know, because we are losing people at such an alarming rate, I mean, uh, there is not enough people to, you know, do the classes. Right. So I, li I listened to a couple of them. I'm going to listen to more when I get back to civilization, uh, back to LA in a, in a couple of weeks, and it's ah, okay. easier for me to listen to. <laughs> You know, like I'll listen to them, like I'll even just turn them on, especially mm -hmm. those you don't need to look at much. And I'll just use my headphones while I'm doing stuff and listen to them. So I'm hoping right. to do a little bit. 
Well, what's the, what are you guys heading into? What's left? What are the major, not in detail, but just sort of broad brush? Um, so this week we were doing um, um, scaling graphs, right? Um, how do you take a graph and scale it? And there was another one where we were looking at uh, expressivity, right? So how do you uh, uh, express, you know, how, how do you calculate expressivity of the graph? So these are kind of, uh, I think they're slightly theoretical. Uh, my main uh, goal there was to learn about uh, graph techniques, right? And some of this is coming up is, you know, how do you um, make a, a node invariant to the, you know, the graph itself, right? So in the sense that, uh, you know, if I have a, a graph with nodes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, um, now if I just switch, um, say, you know, um, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, right? Um, then the graph would look different and maybe the, you know, the connections would also look different. How do you make it invariant, right? So that regardless of how you, which order you provide the sequence in, the adjacency matrix should look the same. So there are ways to do that. I mean, by doing, you know, you basically look at its surroundings and you kind of create uh, features for it. So those are kind of useful. The other thing I was looking at was pi geometric and, you know, that there, you know, there are exercises which are, uh, you know, using that. Um, we also did a little bit of, in the homeworks, we did a little bit of uh, message passing. So essentially, you know, each of these um, uh, layers, right, the graph sage or the GCN, the, the attention network, the GIN, whatever, right? So each of them have different message passing strategies by which they get neighboring information, right? Um, and, you know, so how do you implement such, right? So most of the time you don't actually care, but it's kind of important if you're doing research and you want to get a new, um, you know, graph layer in. So, uh, but they taught us that as well. So that was nice. And that's that's basically all I'm getting out of it, really. I mean, um, so, it, so let me, let me, let me ask you, the, the, the invariant stuff, is that directly related to the embeddings or is that more general to graphs? It's a uh, variant problem. It kind of leads to embeddings because it can lead to a lot of embedding strategies. But even for straight up machine learning where you don't use embeddings, these kind of well, strategies. I'm sorry, might be... I, I, I don't mean embeddings. I mean, it's basically a machine. When you take a graph and you do some ML with it, mm -hmm. that's when the invariance matters. Or is yeah, it exactly. fundamental? Okay. No, that, that's basically, you know, it's a practical thing. That's why we need it. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, right, and, and is I, I forget is this class? It's it, it's graph ML. It's really yes. focused on ML rather than like analytics. Exactly, or, right, right. Graphs for integration and that mm -hmm. whole world. Okay, okay. And you were going to say uh, you were going to summarize up a little bit. I think or say something about what no, you aren't getting out of the class, maybe. Well, no. I mean, I didn't expect too much beyond this. You know, this is what I want needed, right? So. Uh, basically, a way to use graphs. Um, I I have used uh, Neo4j earlier, you know. So uh, the analytics piece mostly I can do. What I did not know and what this uh, thing helped me is like you know how to look at features, right? So again, very machine learning uh, bent on that, right? Um, you know, the only way I knew how to make features out of nodes was basically you know run um, these graph things like degree centrality between the centrality, right? Get all a you know, whole bunch of these and basically string them up in a vector, right? And that was my node. Um, or if you had uh, a text input, right? You could just use uh, document vectors and use that instead. So these were, you know, these are nice uh, new ideas that uh, I got out of it. Yeah. And uh, uh, I guess another area that you might that's related, right, would be um, with graphs, right? Because the idea is using graphs to solve tools or using ML with graphs to solve problems. But another one is using, you know, you had the ACL uh, summary and towards data science that you posted. I read that one. And, and one of the things is actually using knowledge graphs in ML, and they actually talk right in there about inserting it as layers Mm -hmm. in your uh, transformer model or your... Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah I, I remember that, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I mean, I think it's kind of early stages, but it mm-hmm. it basically shoves that knowledge of the world in between layers to adjust your um, vector space. Mm-hmm. Yeah, basically kind of priors, right? You're adding priors to your thing. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there was some sort of adaptive loss function. So mm-hmm. anyway, okay. I guess. But but so far you have not. Have you had any? You haven't actually implemented anything with graphs at work. Um, with graphs, well, yes and no. So we did some um, a bit of a graph search kind of thing with Node 2 X. Um, so you know the connected right. papers from LNAI. Uh, you know they basically did something. I'm not sure exactly what. I just know uh, you know what the connected papers does feature wise. So I took those that idea and I implemented it with Node 2 X, and I got pretty good results. So that was uh, one uh, thing that uh, you know we did yeah. internally, and uh, there was another one where it's more like the first thing I was talking about, where you know you just uh, take these um, um, you know these graph degree centrality and all these numbers, right, uh, node metrics, and you string them up into a vector. So this was done by a colleague. Uh, he took he did page rank on our Scopus graph and uh, basically stuck that as a feature on each of the articles and that is being used for um, as a signal for uh, searching rank relevance yep when you get an embedding for a node through message passing you the examples i saw of doing it, you actually have to have a vector for that node, yes, right, a multi-dimensional vector for that node, and the message passing is just bringing in those vectors from other places, and you combine them. But when you have a node, and that node has, let's say, properties, you know, like measurements and mm-hmm. numbers, and just not vector stuff, names, whatever it is, categories, can you, you, you'd have to then somehow turn all of that into a vector first, right? Yes. Okay, and how do you do that? I mean, so that's sort of like, how do you go from the structured, because normally when you have a knowledge graph in an enterprise, not a content-based one or a topic-based one, but a knowledge graph of entities in an enterprise where it's coming out of the analytics or integration world, most of what you have about each node, each entity, is this structured data. So, you know, it's like a data frame, right, or Excel, whatever, you have a structured data, and those are all just attribute value pairs, pretty much, right? Mm -hmm. With, with address, name, category, I don't know, propensity to buy, whatever the numbers are in there. How do you go from a, a structured data frame to a vector, right? Because if you can do that, then you can take these knowledge graphs and then use message passing and have a single embedding for each node. Right. Do, you have, do you know how they do that? Uh, some of it is just, you know, if it's a continuous variable, you can quantize it and, you know, put it in buckets and use those buckets as your feature uh, features. Or you could use them raw as well, um, but you know usually people quantize it. If it's categorical, you do a one-hot encoding, and then either you use it as is, or you send it through some kind of projection layer, which you know squeezes them together, um, and then that's your feature vector. So you can you can quantize basically uh, numbers. Yes. But so so you, so how do you? So you quantize a number and you can, of course, one hot encode categories. Mm-hmm. But what about the other data? Um, the other data is also categorizable, right? I mean, if you have, uh, let's say, t-shirt size, for instance, right? So that's like maybe five or six categories. You could do that or days of the week or <clears throat> things like that, right? What would you um, classify as something that you cannot? Well, I mean, then you also might have like a... Um, well, a person's name, you just can't include that in there, and it probably doesn't make sense, right? Or a person's address. or But if that address turns into a category because it becomes a city or something fine or a state. And then, but, but what about um, a uh, reviews that person's done? I guess you could put that into, Text. you know, vector, but then you have to combine that with the others and turn it into a single number for your vector space? Like, how do you take... No, I mean, you could, you could just concatenate that vector, right? Uh, so if you look at uh, Google has done this and it's a very popular paper. Um, they have something called wide and deep. Right? What was that? Wide and deep. 
Okay, wide and deep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when, whenever I have this kind of problem, I kind of look to that for inspiration, right? So, you know, I think they uh, they combined. So the wide was, uh, I think, text, and the deep was, I think, um, tabular data, or vice versa, right? So, and they have a, you know, like they have an architecture that handles both. So essentially you don't have to have it like inline to do everything together. You could take these and do pre-processing like, you know, uh, and that works as well. Like, like, yeah. So have you ever seen, have you seen an example where with a graph embedding where they do that, where they convert their tabular data? Cause typically that's most knowledge graphs. I mean, the examples I saw when I did like the sage graph stuff and all that it all is like documents are your part you know your knowledge yes. of who who read this who wrote this that kind of stuff but that's not a normal that's only a very specific use case a more common use case for a knowledge i mean for a graph or a knowledge graph is this sort of data integration one where they're all entities kind of like yuri has but where they're all entities and you have structured data you're coming out of the database world right not the content world and so I guess what you helped me do here is connect the dots between how you could, have you ever seen an example of someone doing that where you quantize one hunt and code, concatenate, combine all this sort of wide versus deep stuff. You end up with a vector for each node and then you can use, um, you know, message passing and embedding to do stuff. No, I haven't uh, seen it on a graph, but I've seen it on normal non-graph uh, kind of classification uh, setups. Okay. Uh, also one other thing, um, since you're talking about entities, um, so you have to differentiate between, so whenever you're doing knowledge graphs, right? You're doing, uh, you know, relations and two entities at least, right? When you're talking about triples. So you have three things going on here. You have the knowledge, uh, sorry, you have the node embeddings, right? Which, uh, and you have um, the relation embedding, right? Uh, relation embeddings, you can kind of fake by, you know, taking the two node embeddings and concatenating them. And if you're just going to do straight up. So yeah, so that's also another, you know, so there, there is like a second aspect to this. If you're looking at the structure, um, you know, so that's where the, the PyKeen stuff comes in, right? Trans-C and Rotate and all these uh, different uh, knowledge graph uh, embeddings, right? So they, they look at, yeah. uh, you know, entities as more like at the structure level, not, not you know, towards so you could use those like uh, together right if you had uh, node features and you have these you know the, the structure features then you can maybe join them together and use them for something yeah you got the tabular features and the, the, the whatever yeah and you could also of course relationships matter a lot in um yeah. knowledge graphs so incorporating some some of that into there would be interesting okay Right, that, that helps me really define that space. So that's good. I, I, I just couldn't find any examples in any of the tools I looked at where they actually did that tabular to um, vector space stuff. So. Yeah, I think wide and deep, let me find a thing. It's actually supposed to be a famous paper. So, so, so I'm, I'm starting to take that class also. But I'm I'm trying to catch up, so I'm I'm uh, trying to do classes to to catch up with everybody, and then and then like doing classes in the middle. Uh, um, this is the graph one. Yeah. Okay. Um. So I. Uh, uh, yeah. So so we actually would basically what we're doing is is exactly like message passing, right? So mm -hmm. we have uh, we just don't call it that. Um, uh, but yeah, so when when you guys were going over, I think it was a homework one last time. It's uh, it, we're doing exactly that. We like you know add you know we're passing embedding from the neighbors, but just you know just this is explicit last, last weekend, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. But we're doing it explicitly. We just like mix some. Um, uh, not using any gener general uh, graph, we just like literally okay. like okay. Uh, rotating, rotating vectors, so mm -hmm. like doing linear combinations of vectors. Okay. Uh, but but interestingly, so we have our ve node vectors are pure uh, NLP embeddings, and uh, 
we have uh, known NLP information, but uh, we never thought of using them in, as like a separate as a separate feature. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if it would be useful or not. Like uh, so, the typical typical um, uh, like categorical features we have is packaging, right? Okay. Because everything you sell is packaged in the different containers. Mm-hmm. Uh, but right now we just uh, so our embedding is is the se- embedding of the sentence packaged in three pound containers, packaged in two pound containers. I see. Okay. So, so we, um, I don't know if it would be useful to have it as a separate, uh, uh, separate feature. Um, yeah. But because, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know, because in a sense it's a, I don't know if it's a, it's a useful to find. Like, so it's definitely most important, like what it is, and then and then like how it's packaged is less important. Exactly. But, but are there are there different ways of saying this? Right, you know, uh, maybe packaged in three pound containers, or uh, sometimes you just say um, liquid container three pounds, something like that. So maybe then it can you know it can capture the. Um, you know, the different variants with your um, embeddings, right? Otherwise, yeah. it might be better to just, you know, list them out and, you know, bin them or categorize them or something. Yeah, so, so the hope is that, that the pure word embedding will, will basically cache those as similar. Ah, okay, got it. Right, right. Yeah. So, Yuri, you guys don't have those category. You don't have categorical data proper, right? You don't have for each entity like packaging types or something no we might at some point like like when they when they actually like now that they're actually building like real anthology out of it so it may actually like have us um and this is where i don't know if it's going to be like a different class or instance of the same class like i don't know how how they're going to do it um so uh yeah, I don't. I don't know if it would be useful or not to have it as a separate feature. Yeah, maybe not. I mean, maybe uh, since you are depending on, you know, the commonalities, maybe it uh, makes sense to keep it that way, right? Actually, like what would be interesting. Um, so, so I always was proposing that. So, so we, we essentially what we are working on are keys to the database. Uh, um, what I always thought would be a good check, and they actually do it like after the fact, after the after the you know mapping, we we actually see if data makes sense, right? Like you know, um, we bring a new source if we already have. Our, similar data in the same region, it's a useful thing to compare and see if your ballpark is the same. Right, right. And the sources could differ and, and, and you know, there are like exceptions where like there's no data or data is like zeroed out. Or, but but in, if data is there, um, you sort of expect them to be same, same order of magnitude, you know, uh, depending on like reporting source, uh, unless they like, you know, really, really like because a lot of like data reported by the government is not that trustworthy, oh, okay. uh, especially like non-US government. Um, but um, I thought it would be useful to actually um, maybe use value of the data as a, as a feature. So, um, but I haven't thought of using it in the same network. I always thought. You know, once we have candidate mapping, you can actually like see if if um, you can let's add, try it. Let, yeah. Let's try it. Like, are we actually getting the 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 similar ballpark of data? And if we're not, that means unit is wrong, or like most uh, most most right. most often, or we really like you know we screwed up. What kind of uh, you know? Uh, you, quite often, it's just like a, within the graph we we didn't we map only like a sub. Uh, sub value, so uh, 
somebody was reporting like the whole wheat and we saw it sold during winter wheat things like I that. I see, okay, okay. Yeah. So. It's a little bit of an anomaly detection problem or a distribution, yeah. normal yeah. distribution. I mean, I always thought of doing that with classification documents, too, actually. Take, like, a, all the documents that have been auto-classified, beer auto-classifier to a particular category, topic, and then look at those thousand documents or whatever they are and, and look for, you know, outliers and that kind of stuff. So like post-classification cleaning up the data. Yeah, that would be cool. That's a cool idea. I mean, obviously, it would probably be, like, you know, raising those to the taxonomists or the classification folks. Right. And then you'd want to feed it in as a negative example, maybe. I don't know. It's kind of like what active learning is doing, sort of. Right. They kind of map out that space, too. Yep, that's true. So, so Yuri, you guys don't have a lot of tabular structured data for each entity, right? Because your, your ontology really is growing out of your matching stuff. Yeah, so it's mostly it's a um, it's a name. Um, it's actually can be multi um, uh, somebody was just suggesting that uh, because we already have uh, so it can be more than one name because we already yeah, so it's a collection of names. That's it. I'm just I'm continuing with my streamlit work and rebuilt my word to vec model uh, of synthetic sequences. Now just about tripling the amount of data in it. Um, very easy to rebuild. It's pretty robust and just really dealing with streamless stuff and using some of their new stuff like forms and state, uh, which are wonderful. Yeah. And uh, I'd be glad at some point if you if you want, CG, when you get back into the streamlit thing, I can show you it, my code so you can see how I've used those things. It's pretty nice, straight. nice. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah, I discovered something about uh, streamlit from somebody else's code. Uh, this is to uh, you know put columns in your output, right? So mm -hmm. you know it's a beta columns or something it's called. Yeah, that's what I'm using. I'm using beta. I'm using. They're no longer beta, but I, that was just a couple of days ago. I haven't updated okay. that. Okay. Yeah. Beta columns. I'm, I've been using those, and um, just help helps you with layout. Um, right. The thing that they don't have yet, which is I'm still having to do, is create dynamic widgets. Mm, so, okay. so that it updates its values every time um, when they if they change. You know, like the selected values. So, okay. uh, I, I'd have to show you. But basically, what I mean by dynamic widget is you change the key each time the page loads. Mm -hmm. No, each how each widget has a key. Right, right. Oh, I see. So like okay. a, like right. a multi-select widget has mm -hmm. a key. And what I do is, I, when someone selects stuff, when you run the page after the selection, um, uh, you know, when they click the button, I store those selected values. And then when the widget regenerates, I give it a new key, and mm -hmm. I have it use those selected values. And that's like the only way I can get it to maintain the selections. Like if someone has four selections and then they re get rid of one after they've already run it, and then you run it, you can't, it gets all discombobulated. So anyway, okay. that's one of yeah. the things that's still kind of painful and weird. Hopefully we'll deal with that in the future. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the other thing that I still want to do over the next month or two, I'm hoping to do a pine cone, um, you know, vector search, uh, right, right, yeah. managed service uh, thing. So, all right, guys, anything else anyone yeah. wants to bring up? Or go ahead. Um, I'm, um, actually, I'm, I'm going on uh, European vacation uh, oh, next cool. week well, um, on Thursday. So, um, I'll try to call in. I think it will be evenings, um, but uh, yeah. I'm, 
Yeah. Oh shit! You reminded me. I, I'm out of touch next Friday. I'm like on the road. It's okay, part we of can, my, my migration right. style. You want to? You, you want? What'd you say? You want to skip it? Yeah, we can skip it. Okay. So, so we'll skip next Friday then. Sure. Okay. I'll uh, I'll post that. The following Friday, I'll be on vacation. Uh, so I'm not sure how that'll work out. I think we could plan on doing that still if you guys want, and I can, uh, you know, hopefully make that work. So do we want to skip two or just one? We can do skip two as well. I mean, it's... It, you know. Yeah, we could probably use the time off. Yeah. How about you, Yuri? What should we skip two or one? Um, uh, I think I'll be flying uh, in two weeks. Yeah. So. So it works for both me and you both. We need to skip yeah. to Friday. So so I'll post I'm, that. I'm, we'll I'm like, that. I might write. Some, I might write some updates. Uh, you know, just on the channel. Yeah. Uh, no, that's cool. You know, the we'll updates fly. you guys provided were like really interesting, and I looked at all both of them and watched them. So please keep doing that. It's awesome. So I'll do the same. All right, well, enjoy your next two weeks. We'll, we'll talk in three. I'll remind you guys when we're about to have the next one so you know that we're coming out. Cool. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. All right. Take it easy. Talk to you guys later. All right. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.